We're going to go right to the next talk and save uh, questions for uh, all three speakers. So, Donna, if you want to head up. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, very excited to be part of this initial level setting uh, session for the two day workshop. Um, my father was uh, appalled when he learned that I was taking a course called Thinking About Thinking as a Harvard undergraduate, a joint class with the, um, with the law school. And so I have been trying to justify that investment ever since. <laughs> And so today I will uh, give you a, a set of questions that hopefully will, will guide your thinking um, about how we approach this issue of virtual clinical trials. Um, starting with, what is a quality clinical trial? Um, as a new uh, executive committee sponsor of the clinical trials transformation initiatives, quality by design, it's certainly a question that has been top of mind for me. Uh, for the past few months, um, in addition to the certainly the work I've been doing in this area for for the several years, but a quality clinical trial must be more than just error free. A quality clinical trial is one that generates the minimal amount of credible, replicable. That's an issue I know we've been uh, really focused on lately. Valuable data needed to answer meaningful questions. Something that's very important, top of mind for patients. Um, with the least burden on participants, the least cost, at the least amount of time. And I hope that the uh, hierarchy of these qualifiers um, are points of discussions for the next few days. Um, but that is sort of how I have been ranking them. In addition to this definition of a, a quality clinical trial, I also think that mindful of the noise to signal ratio, so yes, I, I am married to a medical researcher, so that's stuff we talk about at the dinner table, noise to signal ratios, um, includes patient characteristics likely to receive the drug or intervention. So the divergence between research and real world effects is small. Because often the lack of generalizability or applicability really is disheartening to patients. I know it's often disheartening to me. Um, I sat uh, yesterday in the infusion chair in a uh, community gastroenterologist, and I know that they have a very robust research function. But as I was talking to them about the potential types of research that they have, I, I you know, just let her off the hook thinking, I'm like, I know none of them will, uh, will apply to me. Um, I know I wouldn't be included in any of them, um, or will actually be specifically excluded um, because I have a J pouch. So, um, so we'll just have to trust on faith that uh, any drug that comes out, um, although it's will be prescribed to me, will actually be helpful to me. And as somebody who has been on every class um, of drugs uh, in gastroenterology for for inflammatory bowel disease over the ages, um, it's you know something that I have learned to live with, but something that is um, not far from my mind when I think about uh, the applicability of the research to me. This issue, though, of, of generalizability and applicability is also important for all of us as we think about uh, demonstrating value, because it is also uh, used as a reason for limiting access by payers when the real world uh, patient population in which the drug is prescribed is not the one that was uh, researched in the trials. So I think there are many reasons why we really need to think about what a quality clinical trial is and who does it include from the very beginning. Now, the, there is an advantage of virtual clinical trials, and, and, and I think we should think of it not as a separate type of trial, but as a way of thinking about research that meets this new definition of quality that I've just given you. And as we certainly think about how we deploy wearables, telehealth, in-home visits, online data collection, EHRs, remote monitoring, or even as we think about uh, getting over issues of language or um, unfamiliarity um, or computer literacy issues, um, voice recognition or assistance. Maybe Siri can help us all in our trials. Um, those are fun challenges to try to figure out which type of technology will solve uh, different types of problem. But I don't want us to get uh, 
distracted and thinking that the technology um, is, is the answer. Um, the technology is really just to help us solve these greater questions that we need to be asking ourselves. So what is not working well from the patient perspective? Well, well Ray set it up very, very nicely uh, for me of all the different ways, and I'll focus on just a few. So let's start with the questions being asked. They almost never answer questions that as a patient with uh, concurrent diseases, talking with other uh, patients across many diseases that we want answered. They're fascinating scientific questions. I understand that. Um, I'm not only married to a physician, but uh, we have you know two two now in our uh, of our children and counting. Um, so fascinating, brilliant, whatever. Not helping me live better lives. So let's start asking some questions that might actually help me live better lives. Um, the outcomes and endpoints selected. I think that as we do more research through virtual clinical trials, getting closer to communities, the quality of those questions and the qualities of the endpoints and the outcomes that we're measuring can be improved. So when we think about improving clinical trials, that's the first most important um, aspect that we need to start with. The inclusion-exclusion criteria, um, I, I've certainly addressed from a personal perspective, but um, often from a protocol feasibility perspective. I look at so many, and when I think about matching them up to the populations who have those diseases, I'm like, you don't actually want patients in your trial. There are probably five patients who wouldn't be excluded by the criteria that you have in the trial. So I think a little um, magical realism, um, or more, more just realism, realism in the inclusion criteria, um, and working with patients, we can certainly help you with that. And I think mining data in new ways to truly understand what the patient populations can and should be um, in, your, in your trials would lend um, moralistic more realistic inclusion exclusion criteria, um, more likely to have patients who are actually recruited um, into the trials and retained into the trials. The consent process, certainly. The first time I saw Apple Research uh, Kit presented to, to a small group of us, um, there were lots of bells and whistles. But to me, the aha moment was in the consent process, in its um, it's, it's sort of digestible chunks of consent. Rather than the all or nothing sign away um, uh, that uh, is, is, is normal um, in a you know, unique combination of, of medicalese and legalese that we can find only having come, of materials having come through an IRB. Um, instead, this was something that was, you know, in plain English, it was digestible, it was um, only as much consent um, as was needed for the situation, and then as different situations came up, there would be additional consent. And so it enabled people to um, consent meaningfully, I think freely, for the first time, and it's something that we can learn from. Then we get to the number, length, timing, and location of visits, um, as Ray Slide so, so um, eloquently put out. 70% um, of potential participants live more than two hours away from a study center. So who have traditional trials been for? Um, how, why are we surprised that less than 5% of people are participating? How could this possibly fit into people's lives as we've currently constructed it? Um, the expectations that we have of patients for the number of procedures, and certainly coming from the hepatology field, we get a little biopsy happy, and I have to walk people back from that. Um, People often say, well, it's only 20 minutes. It's only 20 minutes for you as the physician. For me, it's six hours of lying on my side so I don't bleed out or die, but you know. Um, so we need to think of the expectations, whether it's for fasting um, or for the number of procedures that we need uh, and involve in a, in a trial. The structure and the contents of visits. I think when we look at what's available today, the questions uh, I certainly have as a patient, as a, as a patient you know, who wears multiple wearables, who has a wireless scale uh, every morning, uh, taking my weight, blood pressure cuffs at home, all these different things, I, I ask, you know, why are you collecting or asking me anything that could be collected passively, electronically, regularly, in advance, or communicated via FaceTime? So I would challenge us all that the default should be what we now calling a virtual clinical trial, and that any trial sponsor would need to justify 
why their trial was not a virtual trial. How close can we come to obtaining the needed data in the course of a study participant living their life or receiving normal care? I think that's the question we need to be asking. There's also this incredible opportunity of uh, how can we foster ongoing relationships with participants to understand conditions longitudinally and generate new and relevant questions. Certainly, uh, the return of data to uh, trial participants was a fantastic first start. But how often are we asking them to critique their trial experience um, and asking them what their experience in that research study or as patients um, gives us ideas for improvement both in the process in the trial and for the direction of our research. I think the advent and advancement of virtual clinical trials, which I hope will soon be just called clinical trials, is an incredible opportunity for patient engagement. So thank you.